welcome to yet another episode of MH Consultants Breakfast Panther. And today we have a very special guest with us and who has a profile that's very similar to Ron. So Ron is going to take a you know front seat in terms of uh, you know quizzing our guest with a lot of interesting questions. So if you are somebody enjoys the fin talk or some somebody who enjoys corporate finance talk, this podcast is for you. Uh, I'd like to introduce our guest today. Uh, welcome Anshul. Uh, Anshul Devakta is the Senior Partner and Head of Corporate Finance at Baker Tilly across the MENA region. And Anshul has over 20 years of experience in Tier 1 global consulting firms including KPMG, 12 years at KPMG. That's where I know Anshul from and uh, I've crossed paths with him at KPMG which was my previous firm as well. At KPMG he was a Senior Director and the Head of Corporate Finance Practice. So, Anshul comes uh, with a lot of corporate finance experience and we're very happy to have him on our podcast today. Welcome, Anshul. Uh, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming, of course. It's a special honour for me. This is our 41st episode, isn't it? It is. And the first finance guy that we've had on. Pretty much, yes. Yes, yeah, they're all usually in marketing. So, it's nice to talk to somebody that this, comes from the same kind of educational background, uh, work experience backgrounds. So I would say, Anita, if we start talking too much accounting and finance speak, please tell us because we could really get into it. Yes. And of course, this podcast is not just for finance people. Absolutely. So keep us on the straight and narrow, please. Yes, no, I will. No assets, no liabilities. No, no, assets no debits, no credits, yes. whatever they are. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, well, I normally start off with what's for breakfast, Anita, and it's a very poor breakfast, so I suppose we've got a very small budget for breakfast. <laughs> That's not the case. The <laughs> breakfast is on its way. Anyway, um, you've got your yeah. something. I've got my tea and Angela's got coffee. Mine is matcha. Oh, okay. breakfast is here. <clears throat> All right, so we'll start then. Yes, thank you very much for coming. Um, I know Baker Tilly. I think if I'm not wrong, it's the ninth largest accounting firm in the world. Uh, and it's here in the MENA region. And that you, you especially have several areas of expertise. Corporate finance companies are always looking to additional finance, uh, funding generally, restructuring and valuations, amongst others. Uh, which of those areas are keeping you particularly busy at the moment? Uh, I think thankfully all of it. Um, so different markets while I cover the entire MENA region, but I think within the MENA market, you have subtle differences. Uh, the biggest market in our region is Saudi. So Saudi is in a completely different trajectory. There it's all about new projects, giga projects, infrastructure, PPPs, and, and that's where the major financing is happening. PPPs? Okay, sorry, no jargon. Uh, Public-private partnerships. Yeah. Okay. So what happens is whenever governments announce mega projects, you need capital. Yeah. And capital is pretty much the epicenter in which the entire infrastructure development happens. Right? right. Either the government can fund it on its own, or you need private participation, or right. you need public and government Partnerships, uh, partners, partnerships at the same okay. time. So I think, to me, uh, if I summarize, Bahrain is is looking at consolidation, which is inbound M and A's, which are happening. M and A's, yes. Mergers and acquisitions. I know. Yeah, I know. Well, that's easy enough. Um, so Bahrain is seeing a lot of debt restructuring. Mm. Uh, it's it's seen some consolidation within within the sector. Yeah. Uh, UAE is, uh, it's all about growth. Uh, yeah. So I, I think so, so what it does is our, our platter is pretty much full. And although different markets give you a different landscape, but the opportunities are just immense. So I'm very excited about the MENA market currently. Okay. I think MENA, India and China are pretty much the growth yes. drivers today. So okay. different demand in different countries. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So funding is important, obviously. Yes whether it be for startups, expansion, acquisitions. So how does the involvement of a professional advisor 
help the process of raising capital rather than producing, as, let's say, internally, we have, the company may have very good accountants, finance people. They could produce the feasibility study, the, the business plan. But why, why, why would we use a professional advisor for that? I think the important aspect is to, to unlock the shareholder value. To me, if, if you have quite a few number of shareholders, it is important to know that what value your company really has, whether it's X million dollars, $100 million, a billion dollars, you, you find all these fantastic terms like unicorns. Yeah. Right? How do you think they have been created? Yes, there's a great product, there's a great founder. Yeah. But you do need professional advisors to unlock that value to the shareholders because at, at any point of time, you don't know how much you're worth. So leave it to the professional advisors uh, and I'm sure Ron, you would concur with me that we do add that value. That's the value creation we bring to the table. I think we're going to agree on everything. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank and there's, <laughs> there's the independence of the advisor, isn't there? Yeah. If I'm the accountant working for the company, of course I'm going to show a rosy picture, aren't I? I want to keep my job. Yeah. But you guys with that independence, that you've done, you've done this work before, uh, a funder, or say a bank, or angel investor, or whatever. Well, I've answered the question for you. Uh, we'll want to see that independence, experience, and qualification that uh, that you give. And also, I think any prospective investor, whenever they invest in a company, right, they want to know whether the accounts which are presented to them are they fair, accurate. And so at any point of time, they will undertake a diligence process. Yes. Right? So if you say, well, I would like to review the last three years or last five years of historical data, that is called the review period, do you need someone to present and, and articulate that to any prospective investor? It's not also just about mm. showing your books of accounts yes. because again, mm. numbers on their own, they don't talk. Yeah. You need an advisor who understands Makes numbers. Makes sense of it, yeah interprets it and then articulates it in a language which is, I would say, hopefully it's not Greek or Latin to someone. Absolutely. <laughs> Can I go a bit further into that? Because Please. I Please. I teach finance at a university. And Wonderful. Doing the numbers, producing a profit and loss account or statement of income and a statement of financial position is not difficult, is it? You can teach somebody to do that within a year. Yeah. But it's being able to take those figures and communicate what they actually mean to non-financial <coughs> people. You yes, yes, totally. Good, 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 good. So if, you, if a company is looking for funding, yeah. those, the providers of funding, what are they looking for in order to give the funds? So, so any uh, prospective investor or, uh, or a lender they are looking at whether the company can generate recurring cash flows. Are they sustainable in nature? And do you think the company can be ahead of the curve in terms of competition or not? So, so very simple things like, are you a market leader? Or are you, are you catching up with the competition? Mm -hmm. And any type of financing which you take, what is it that is going to do it? So if, if, for example, if the founder says, well, I'm going to cash out, hmm. it's got a different connotation to the entire exercise as opposed to I take the financing and I inject that cash or capital back into the company. Right. So there's a huge difference to that, right? Banker, on the other hand, would look at, uh, will my borrower, do they have the ability to service the cash flows or not? To hmm. pay it back. To pay it back on time, hopefully, yeah. and we don't have to undergo any liquidation or right. litigation process in that way. So, end of the day, all of us are in the business of making money. At the end of the day, who makes more money, whether it's an investor or a lender, is, is really depends on, on the company, the operations, the products in which uh, you are really uh, catering to. Got that? Yeah. So, traditionally, companies borrow from banks. Yeah. Uh, what other sources are available other than banks? And are these sources available in the <coughs> sure. So I think, yes, traditional bank financing is, is, is the most common and in, in my view, the most cheapest as well. 
But over a period of time, banks also have to report their numbers to the regulator and also to their shareholders. Banks also have a limit beyond a specific sectoral limit as what we call it as a sectoral obligation, you cannot exceed. So where, where you, are in, uh, you are lending more in the real estate sector or tourism sector or manufacturing sector, beyond a point of time, banks don't have the ability to lend. lend. Mm. Banks also are quite risk averse in terms of lending to a startup because yes. there are absolutely no cash flows which, which a startup can really yeah. demonstrate. Which is where venture capitalists, private equity funds, private credit funds, family-owned offices yeah. come come into the picture. Do, do we and, have angel investors here? And and angel investors as but well. But are they there in the in the in the region? I think Dubai is, in my view, is pretty much at the forefront, and, okay. and Bahrain and uh, the rest of the GCC. I think people are uh, playing catch up, but I think it's a, it's a great source to be in at this point of time. Okay. Because just imagine who knows uh, what the next Kareem can be or the next uh, unicorn can be from from our markets, right? So here's a huge opportunity for VCs or private equity funds to fund that business. VCs, mm -hmm. venture capitalists. Yes, venture capitalists. <laughs> Right. Oh, sorry, sorry. And uh, of course, the government through Tam Keen and yes. subsidised yes. interest rates. So, have the recent increases in interest rates affected your clients' ability to get funding? Absolutely. I think the heart, as there's an old cliche which says, cash is king, right? Yeah. So, if, if you're paying anywhere between 8, 10, 12 percent uh, on yeah. an annual yeah. basis to a lender, Imagine the impact it has on your day-to-day -day operations, working yes. capital, and, and the bottom line, right? So it's it's got a huge negative impact. And we all understand why the Feds have actually raised the interest rates mm. to basically control inflation. Yes, understandable. But which is where a professional advisor such as us uh, helps in, steps in, and we look for newer ways of financing and providing capital to the uh, yeah, companies. Because higher interest rates would reduce... The, the place where a project would be profitable or not, yeah. or yeah. not profitable, have positive cash flows. Yes. There's Ooh. a difference between cash flow and profitability. Yes, there is. Oh, you know, eh? Yeah. Okay, so I need to ask some questions before yes. I move to, to you. So, uh, so you've been with Baker Tilly for a year plus now, right? Uh, what sort of projects, exciting projects you've been doing in the region? Would you like to throw some light on that? Sure. So I think uh, we are helping a fairly large, I would say, top three private equity fund in Saudi. Mm -hmm. They are in the process of acquiring a fairly large uh, healthcare assets. So we are there as buy side M&A advisor. Okay. So just try and think that when I mentioned at the start of our conversation, any prospective investor would like to know whether the numbers which are presented by a target, do they... Are they represented in a true and fair manner or not? Right. So you undertake a financial accounting diligence, you undertake a business plan review, challenge the assumptions which have been provided mm -hmm. by the target, you provide a valuation and an M&A advisory. Right. So that is a role which you play as a buy-side advisor. Buy-side advisor. That's called buy-side M&A advisor. Mm. Okay. You flip the hat around okay. and someone wants to exit the business, someone wants to raise additional capital, someone wants to sell the business. That's when you put up a hat called sell side M&A advisor. Okay. Right. There, the 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 connotation and the representation is completely different. Right. Okay. So so you present numbers which are realistic. You present numbers which are attainable and sustainable. Right. So any buy side M&A advisor, when they scrutinize you, you produce certain set of numbers which are credible enough in okay. the eyes of the investors. Okay. That's interesting. I didn't know. That's just normal for me. I mean, that's, that's absolutely interesting. I didn't know that much about M&As and yeah. stuff. Yeah. So, so those are, I would say, some of the examples of buy side and sell side. We are also helping companies. So once you acquire companies, right, mm. there's a massive integration process which happens, yeah. which is called post-merger integration. Right. So imagine you've got company A and you've got company B, right? You have acquired for a variety of reasons, mm. market growth or uh, you have a product which you don't have it today yeah. but unfortunately systems don't talk to each other it, yeah. right so yeah. how do you integrate the systems how do you integrate the culture how do you integrate all of that together? you pretty that much do everything as it doesn't today. always work does it so right. you do it integration you do organizational oh, change management oh, all of those services absolutely. yeah oh. absolutely now so we're so. moving to you now if you want okay. yeah okay <laughs> 
So let's say, uh, you know, Anita is a serial <laughs> entrepreneur, got several businesses, and she wants to do something else. She's sure. going to retire. She's had enough of being an owner. She wants an easy life. Tell me a few ways that the theory of how her businesses could be valued. We don't need to talk about specific businesses, but just the methods of valuation, if you would, please. Sure. So I think my suggestion for you to retire is ask yourself, have you created an asset which can generate cash flows on its own? Right. Because eventually any investor, they look at the cash flow. Yeah. Right. If, again, there's a difference, if you want to exit 100%, you may or may not get the full value. So right. stay invested in the business, mm -hmm. semi-retire, mm -hmm. let the professionals manage your business. Right. So that at the end of the day, your cash flow income can hopefully help you with your retirement. Right. And somebody like Baker Tilly would help me get in touch with such professionals. Absolutely. All those yeah. uh, okay, aspects as well. Right. Okay. Now, the most common methodologies for valuation, the, these are tried and tested methods are discounted cash flow methodology, yeah. market multiples or transaction multiples. So for example, if your business is listed in, in a different market or a jurisdiction, mm -hmm. what is the closest proxy in terms of margins, multiples you should get? So any prospective investor comes to you and say, okay, I think so your business is worth five times revenue or 20 times earnings mm. or 15 times EBITDA. So yeah. we have enough data points which we can provide to them. EBITDA. So, yeah. so, so margin is the profit, yes. percentage. Yeah. Sales, obviously sales. Yes. E-B-I-T. What's that D -A. one? D-A. Earnings before interest, taxation, depreciation and amortization. Okay. Cash flows. Again, cash yeah, flows. Cash flow. mm. Sorry, cash flows. Yes. Um, just what's the difference between profit and cash flow? Profit is what you earn after, let's say, your calendar year is Jan to December. You paid off your salaries, paid off the finance charges, rent, all of it. That's your neat profit. Profit after yeah. tax on net income. Yes. You add interest costs, depreciation, amortization, you get your operating, operating. cash flows. So that to me is the most closest to what you can earn as a business on a day-to-day -day basis. Because okay. you could make profit but still not have positive cash flow. Yeah. You can make losses but have positive cash flow. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's cash flow will, that will keep the business open or close it. Cash is king. Well, I was about to say that, but of course, there you go, yeah. cash is king. So I don't, actually, I don't think Anita's ready to retire yet. Anita. Yes, but I like how you deeply care for me, Ron. And you've already <laughs> asked an expert what I should do and, you know, start thinking in I've the direction. I've taken work off you there then. <laughs> <laughs> Potential work. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yes, but are you, are you ready to step back? No, not at all. No, not just, even to that I'm just semi, getting started. Semi-retirement. Semi not at all. Still a okay. long way to go. Okay, okay. So uh, for someone who's worked in this field for so many years as you have, um, what advice would you give for someone just starting out in corporate finance? I think a lot of people get scared with numbers. Yeah? I was Num good. Numbers should not intimidate you. Mm. I think you should love numbers. Because the beauty about numbers is numbers, if you just keep it on a standalone basis, numbers don't tell a story. Mm. Which is why once you love numbers, understand it, interpret it, then as an advisor, articulate it and then connect the dots, right? So, for example, if I have to say, I always follow a thousand day golden rule. Mm -hmm. So, what, what is that thousand day golden rule? Thousand day golden rule is if a business is making consistent losses for three years or thousand days, either the product which you sell, the, the, the place in which you sell, the price at which you sell or your processes are, are lousy. Right. Or for 1,000 days, you are continuously making profit, which is ahead of the curve or ahead of the market, which means either mm. your product is in a, in a niche market, you have a preferential pricing advantage, and more importantly, I think you've got some great people. So again, if you follow the 1,000-day uh, rule or a 1,000-day rule book, numbers beyond a point of time 
don't lie, but you need to understand the numbers. So it's the simple analogy, if I can give it to you, a patient walks in into a hospital and he says, I'm perfectly fine. Doctor says, okay, undergo a battery of tests, blood tests and so on. And you've got the report card in front of you. The doctor says, well, on one hand, improve your lifestyle, cut down on smoking or alcohol, or let's say undergo a surgery. That's one brutal way of looking at it. The other way, again, because the report cards don't tell you a story, as, as a financial advisor, we look at the whatever balance sheet or PL, historically last five years, hmm. understand it, interpret it, and again communicate in a very effortless way that this is these are your five problems. This is where you need to fix. Hmm. Sell a business if you have to, no emotions attached, because I think the biggest problem yeah. uh, in our in our uh, part of the world is businesses and entrepreneurs have a lot of emotional connections. Attachment to it. It's really hard to let go. Now, as you speak about this, I have this business in my head, which is, you know, I'm just, I, I really don't know what to do with it. So it is self-sustainable to a great extent, but it's not as profitable as I thought it would be. Uh, so I'm not sure what to do with it. It's just there. But unlock, it share, my... unlock shareholder value. So if, if that means selling business, closing business, um, and just moving on, just move on. Because if even if it doesn't, I'm not putting money from my pocket into it, but it takes a lot of my mind space because I'm constantly thinking about it. Definitely, that is something I have to really take a call on. Maybe you can ask for some consultancy advice after the podcast. Is there a discount for SMEs? <laughs> <laughs> so I say so I, I teach accounting students. Uh, degree level and soon masters but it's getting students into accounting that's difficult because there's some major mistakes or that they think so I'll ask you do you have to be good at maths to be an accountant you have to love numbers let me put it that way well it, okay but that's only one to ten in base one to nine sorry or zero to nine yeah in different orders, it's, there's no real applied maths, is there? No yeah. difficult formulas. Because that, that's what they seem to worry about. And yes. I'm not good in maths. How about I'm not good in maths? You're not? Mental arithmetic, but if you put brackets A over B to the power of Z divided by X I don't over think that's Y, true. He's good at I have maths. no clue. He's humble. Yeah, so. But I'm good at different type of maths, the engineering type of maths. <laughs> yeah, that. Is accounting boring? 100%. 100%. <laughs> okay, well, don't listen to me, guys. Yeah. He loves it. it. <laughs> then how do you make it interesting? I think which is where, if, if you love what you yeah. do. Uh, so again, I think there's a difference between Ron, an accountant and a consultant, which is yeah. where I wear that hat very passionately and very proudly. But we all start as accountants, don't we? Because we need to learn the rules. I never started as an accountant. You didn't? Yeah. So I, I started as an investment banker. All right. and, and that's what I've done for 20 years. So so what so so you you read numbers, you understand numbers, but then again, accountants are poor accountants, they, they just restrict themselves in that those boundaries of numbers. Yeah. Which is why as a consultant, I think you sort of look far beyond yeah. those boundaries. Well, creative I, yeah, creative like solutions think, out of those numbers. Yes. I'd like to think that finance directors can do that as well without being a consultant. I mean, they are also consultants in a way. Well, consultant is a very broad term. They're also yes. employees. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, and I also tell them every company has an accountant or finance yeah. person, isn't it? Yes. Every company you go to, there's somebody that speaks your language. Yes. So the, the message there is there are a lot of jobs out there. Yes. But um, this does not seem to be a very popular profession. Choice. choice for it's hard work, I guess. Well, surely hard of, work. <laughs> it's just a lot of number crunching and lots of long hours, and which may not be everybody's cup of tea, you know? No. Even consulting is such long hours. Like 14, 15 hours a day of your life you give to projects, you know, which at the end of the day, you don't know the, what's the success rate going to be, you know, it's just always so risky. But it's money that makes the world go around, isn't it? Businesses are set up mainly at the moment to make profit. Yes. 
not for CSR, ESG, this or the other. See, I'm using num uh, letters now to mainly make profit. Yeah, definitely. And you're there to help them. Absolutely. Right. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. Not for now. No. That was just so easy, wasn't it? I don't know. Do you have That's anything easy. for us? No. <clears throat> um, I think the, the, the message from my side to any young aspiring yes. uh, professional is uh, whether you take up accountancy or whether you take up any consulting profession, I mean, just, just get to the bottom of it. Um, uh, spend a lot of time understanding the, the broad subject, get into the granularity of it. Yeah. Once you hone those skills over a period of time, uh, I think then the job becomes far more easier. I've spent 20 years. Yeah. I've, I've, I've worked in North America, I've worked in India, I've worked, uh, I've advised clients in Far East, uh, mainland Europe and pretty much in the Levant and the MENA region. Mm -hmm. And consistently, it doesn't matter which part of the world your clients are, mm -hmm. as, as probably Ron mentions, uh, everyone is looking for this one thing, make more make money. Make more money, right? exactly. So when, when you take out the national geographies and the cultures aside, everyone needs that one help. Yeah. And as, as consultants and as, as advisors, we are more than uh, happy to do that. More importantly, I think there's also a little bit of a cultural difference that a good consultant is someone who's brutally honest. Right. Mm. So if 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 a companies are not making enough money, if you beat around the bush, give them wrong advice, then you'll never pro solve the problem. You'll always go round in circles yeah. and which is where that differentiates. So I think in short and summary, um, nothing comes easy. And if you want to be successful, just be prepared to spend long hours. Love numbers don't get intimidated by it. And then, uh, you know, I mean, uh, all opportunities yeah. are there and, and I think you travel the world. Yeah. You travel the world. Yeah. You know anybody that's brutally honest? He is brutally honest. Anyway, not about me today, is it? It's no. about you. Uh, finished? Yes. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank I've you for really having enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So where can we be found and who are you going to thank? We are thanking our sponsors as per usual. Uh, Easy Pay, thank you for your continued support as our main sponsors to our fourth season uh, in into our podcast. And um, you and our viewers can find us on YouTube at MH Consultants. You can also find us on Instagram where you could leave us a query at MH Consultants underscore Bahrain. Thank you so much, Anshur, for joining in today. Thank and you. I think it was yes, a thank you very, very enlightening session, especially for me. I hope it was not technical. No, it wasn't. No, I think we managed wasn't. to keep it reasonably shallow. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. All it was good. Level. It was actually fun. It was a good, good, fun session. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.